Well, Kevin, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Would love to hear a little bit about you. I mean, just how you found out about the podcast, just all the things. Awesome. Thanks for the invitation. Even though I feel like I was a little bit apprehensive about um, whether I had a story that your listeners would really like engage in and some of the other conversations um, that you've had with other people. The more that I thought about it, I think um, listening to some of the podcasts that you've had and really quite frankly, your own, I was just super interested in even if I could share a story that would even just help one person. But the way that I found out about the podcast is a few weeks ago, I was doing a fireside for addiction recovery facilitators and missionaries, and uh, your co-host was there. Yes, and, she was. Uh, <laughs> so I had the pleasure of meeting her, and she said, because of my story, she felt like it would be something that you all would be interested in visiting with me about. And honestly, the more that I thought about that, it just it felt like that's what I needed to do. So my story is, I just feel like I come from a super not so <laughs> interesting past as far as the way that I grew up in a middle class family in Ogden, born in the church and whatnot. But, you know, it's through some of the things and some of the issues that I had. I come from a family. My mother was a convert after the death of, of one of her children, an infant several years into their marriage, she joined the church and my mother and father were married in the temple. Just an average middle-class Ogden family born in the church and doing what other um, <laughs> kids do, you know, that are in that same boat. So that's kind of my deal. Awesome. Well, I know that Warren told me about you right when she got home from that meeting. So we knew that we wanted to have you on after she told me that. I'm just so excited you're here and so excited to kind of hear the rest of your story. So if you want to jump into it, that'd be awesome. Yeah, no problem. I thought what I would do is just sort of take you through a little bit about where my past kind of started and where I kind of started with addiction and and whatnot. Unfortunately, I learned about addiction at a very young age. And little did I know that what was going on when I was in the second grade was the start of something that I was really never going to be able to control. Um, so at a very young age in, in the second grade, through a conversation that I was having with some young pals, they were talking about self-stimulation and, and stuff like that. And you can imagine as somebody that's that age, really, not really understanding what's going on, but what that ultimately led to was um, something that I would find very, very difficult to control and later on a porn issue. Fortunately, I feel like some of the things in, in my world, I feel like I'm super fortunate in really the kind of the time frame I grew up and whatnot. I was born in the late 50s, but as being in school in the 60s and, and 70s, a different time because of cell phones and and stuff like that it you know it's it's a different day i felt super fortunate that even though i had those issues going on that what i'm seeing today in young people um really adults as well but what i'm seeing today is you know through mobile devices and super easy access to social media it's honestly changed the game so my issues really kind of began with addiction and, and at a very young age, learning far too early about addiction. Sadly, in my relationship with my parents has always been, you know, kind of a mixed up, messed up relationship. And when I was uh, 14, we were out on a camping trip with my mom and dad. And I witnessed the drowning of my brother. And so after several hours, they were able to recover him. And that vision of watching him die will basically go down. And seeing them eventually pull him from the water was something that I was never really able to get out of my head. And I would relive it and relive it and relive it. 
And it became something that, I mean, I feel like now with how accessible uh, therapists are and whatnot, that, you know, should something like that have happened, I mean, we have so many resources now and we're so fortunate with what's going on. So sadly, at that time, uh, it was something that was very, as you can imagine, very difficult for my mom and dad. And so it, they were checked out. It was only a couple years later that I discovered that alcohol numbed those feelings and made them <laughs> go away for a period of time. And because my mom and dad were really kind of checked out, it was super easy for me to hide it. And so I carried on for a long period of time, things that really should have been caught by parents who were actively involved in their kids just wasn't the case for me. Missions and relationships with the church was really never on my radar. I would go to church because my parents really, for the lack of a better word, made me. And so I wasn't learning and I, I wasn't super involved. And there came a day when <laughs> I I think it's kind of funny now. Um, my dad came to me and he said, Kevin, I think you've reached a time in your life where you're mad enough to make that decision to go on and go to church on your own. <laughs> and so I did. I made that decision. I made that decision not to go. And it wasn't too many <laughs> weeks after that that he mentioned to me that I wasn't really man enough to make that decision on my own, that he would make it for me. And so, again, the expectation was to to go to church. And so often I'd bless the sacrament in jeans and hung over from the night before and not really given much thought to it. But uh, mission, again, not on my radar. Uh, seminary, I did not graduate and grew deeper in my issues with cell stimulation, alcohol, until one day, a good friend of mine at that time, living across the street, approached me and he said, Kevin, I think you're going to go on a mission. And I looked at him and I, his name's Ralph. And I said, Ralph, that's the farthest thing from my mind. And that's actually not going to happen. And he said, you know, he said, I've been thinking about it. And honestly, I think it is going to happen. And I'm going to do everything that I can to help you do so. And I said, no, Ralph, I, I don't really think that's the case at all. But it wasn't too long that that really kind of plagued my mind. And not long after that, I did make the decision to go on a mission. It was kind of funny when I came home after cutting my hair off, my mom and dad didn't recognize me. So I started the process of trying to uh, get ready to go on a mission with Ralph's help. Unlike other kids who had other issues in regard to stuff they were doing, I wasn't able to go on a mission right away because of my alcohol issues. I needed to wait. And as I did, it was uh, increasingly difficult. But I went on a mission as a person who knew nothing about the LDS church. Very little. Never read the Book of Mormon. I wonder even now if I would have been a, a kid that they would have even wanted to go on a mission. But I did. And I went without having a testimony. I went without knowing really anything about it and soon learned that principles taught in our church were super different than other churches. I mean, you know, primarily God and Jesus and separate people, bodies of flesh and bones and the beings that they are. And I honestly never knew that. It became very apparent that I needed to learn about the church it became apparent that I needed to read the Book of Mormon and honestly gain a testimony on my own. And so I learned about the church through the old discussions that were taught, the book that you had to memorize. And <laughs> I mean, it was super interesting times, but I prayed and I really do believe that the answer was given to me about the Book of Mormon and, and eventually taught the gospel. And specifically, I had a companion that was older when he went on a mission. His mom and dad wouldn't let him go until he was graduated from college. Um, so where most people would sort of quit. But I had no idea what his deal was. He was super involved in 
the discovery and learning about anti-Mormon literature, basically memorization of scriptures, and he has an amazing memory. In fact, there was a time in about 1980 when him and I went into the house of a anti-Mormon literature author and eventual filmmaker. And we had a super long discussion with him that day. And I learned, you know, what other people really kind of think of our church. In that time, I mean, it, I felt like it really helped me gain a testimony of the church, but not apparently deep enough. So I did serve a very faithful mission and really lost myself in that whole work. I was in California in the late seventies when, you know, it was, it was cool to be in California and I've always loved California people. And so I came home with a real loss of direction and where to go and what to do and what to study and what I wanted to be where most people my age would have already made that decision. They would already have been in college. They would already have a direction and I was directionless and started working in a, in a bank at that time in Ogden and met a funeral director, an owner of a funeral home. And, uh, I was intrigued by this guy. So in talking to him, I learned that people would get free rent if they lived at this funeral home and they'd get up in the middle of the night and go for removals, as you would call it, and uh, pick up dead people. And I became fascinated in that whole process. I mean, almost really from the get go. And then I would watch him embalm and I learned about embalming and it almost felt like what was happening to me was a place that I needed to be and had these feelings of the way that I felt was my issues in regard to my brother's death were sort of being healed by being involved in funeral service. So I ended up uh, getting involved in that and that's how I did. But I had a relationship with a gal for a couple of years. We weren't married. And uh, the breakup was ugly and the breakup was hard. A lot of feelings that I had were feelings of like, I, I didn't understand why, and I didn't understand what was happening. And it was super difficult, really sort of the start of my own issues with depression, not really realizing that those feelings of depression really had started years ago through my experiences with my brother. But it was only a few months later that I was working in the bank and I actually saw this woman that I'm married to now and I would watch her come into the bank and get into the elevator and, and felt like I needed to figure out who she was. And one day she came into the bank and she went inside the elevator and the elevators didn't shut and she caught me um, staring at her. And, and so I didn't know what to do. And I certainly wasn't going to take my eyes off her. So I winked at her and her face, she's a very shy woman and her face turned bright red and it was awesome. And soon the elevator shut and I sat there and sort of laughed. I thought that was funny, but I had friends that worked in that bank who told me who she was and I called her. And what's really kind of weird is I don't, I don't want to dive deep into that, but when we started dating, we had only been dating for a few weeks. And through all of this, I've, I've sort of learned that my ability to be able to read people kind of came through. And we started dating and we were having fun. And oddly enough, just <laughs> a lot of our dates were in the mortuary that I worked at because <laughs> I worked nights and she'd come over and MTV was just getting going and all that stuff. And we'd watch MTV and we would watch baseball games because the Atlanta Braves were being shown on TV then. It was just really kind of the beginning of all that stuff. And so we were in the mortuary and we had friends over and I was preaching from the pulpit, just laughing and joking. And, and then uh, her and I went over to my apartment and we were sitting there talking and I'll just make this story super short, but it's really kind of funny. I felt like she had changed. I felt like once where she was having a good time the evening, her personality had shut down and I couldn't understand why. And I really liked her. I, I really wanted to talk to her. I really wanted communication. And finally I asked her, I said, what's wrong? And she said, nothing. 
And I said, seriously, what's wrong? It feels like something's changed. And she said, um, nothing. And I sat and thought about it again. And I asked her again, what's wrong? And she said, nothing. And, and so I finally said, so what if I guess what's wrong with you? Would you tell me? <laughs> and so, um, sure, I'd tell you. And so then I knew something was really seriously up. And I said, honestly, the more that I think about it, I think that we've had a great time tonight with our friends. You and I connected really super well. I think what it is that's wrong with you is I think you want to marry me. And I think you think that I'm not ready for that move in my life. <laughs> Had it not been dark, I wish I could have seen her face because it became how in the world did you come up with that? And it was only a couple months later, honestly, that we were married. We talked about when that would be. Would it be in the summer? This was in September. And she said, no, spring, no. December, we decided to get married in December and really ultimately changed it to November. So a really super quick relationship. So this November, uh, her and I have been married for 40 years and oh my it's gosh, been a crazy awesome. ride. <laughs> um, but through that story, I feel like her and I's relationship, it started super quick. We didn't know a whole ton about each other. And she went on in the later years to say that she felt like I was false advertisement. Mm. I was well done that for a long time. We were married in the temple and soon after um, we moved to Southern California for me to go to mortuary school. I think a lot of your listeners, I, I feel like a lot of it's, we sort of judge the church by the people. And as I've thought over time about our relationship, I had a bishop that I was working nights at a funeral home and going to school during the day. And I had a bishop call my wife and say, so how do you like it? And she said, what's that bishop? And he said, being a lost sheep. And honestly, it upset her. And I think it upset me more. And I don't recall going back to that ward in the two years that, that we were living down in California before we moved back and really sort of this process of of me really kind of being a person that had a testimony of of the church and physically then starting to go to church when we moved back i was asked to teach a gospel doctrine class and it was um it was quite eye-opening it was an old people ward and my wife was asked to be the young women leader and and we were really we had not been very active at all and it was sort of eye-opening and we had a struggle in moving back here and lived here for about a year when I finally decided I couldn't take it here anymore. Um, the job was ugly and our relationship was ugly. We fought a lot and I told her I wanted to move back to California, which we did do and really kind of continued with the inactive behavior and whatnot. Again, not really losing a testimony in the church, but losing a testimony of people and losing a testimony of how essential those pieces are. It was a really scary point. As I got into the funeral service, there were really a lot of curious stories that would happen to me. Eye-opening stories of, like, I know God cares about his people. I had a situation where I was in the mortuary one day. I was asked to meet with a guy, and I won't get into the story, but basically the gist of it was, I sat down with him and I asked him what circumstances brought him here today. And he said, my son's in Paraguay and I need to have him brought back um, here to California. And I said, why was he in Paraguay? And he said he was on a mission for the church. And I looked at him and I said, are you LDS? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, what happened to your son? He told me the story of how this kid was a perfectionist and ended up going to BYU. And through his perfectionism, he started, his grades had dropped, as they often do when you start school as a young freshman. He got into depression and, and whatnot and got into medication, and the parents didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he went on his mission thinking that the Savior would really help him that he wouldn't need his medication 
he ended up waiting for his companion to shower and he dressed and he left caught a bus to the end of town and waited for one to come back and jumped in front of it it was heartbreaking it was absolutely heartbreaking oh, and my... it wasn't long after that that i had another experience where one of the other funeral directors there said i'm kevin i'm not connecting with his family and and i think you would and i went into the room what brought them there was their daughter had just moved to california graduating from a school here in utah and she had her apartment broken into her husband was at work there was a homicide it was her and so the parents were there to bring her back to utah and they told me where they wanted to ship her and i said that i'm familiar with that area i'm familiar with that funeral home it ended up that she went to school with my brother-in-law and it ended up that it was a family that they knew it was just again a reminder to me that you know even though bad things happen to good people god's still there it wasn't really too much longer after that i had made the decision to go back to drinking so i did so behind my wife's back oftentimes she would come up to utah to see her family I would shut down the, the blinds and do what I had to to work and then drink myself crazy at night and all behind her back. And our kids were super young at that point, so I had really two and on the verge of three. And they're fairly close in age. I carried that behavior on and more experiences through funeral service where I started to feel this feeling of like everything in, in my life is everybody else's problem, not my own. And what's sad is I blamed my parents for my problem with alcohol. I blamed my parents for issues that I had. I blamed my wife because she didn't really want me to talk about issues that happened at work because sadly, I always cho I chose wrong times uh, to talk about those things. So I bottled them up and quit talking to her about him. And it became just something that I would hide from her, which, you know, when you think about it, honestly, how did I hide that from her? And then fast forward to my own kids and one of them coming home after having been drinking and her always having this desire to get my kids and tell them good night. And she goes up and gives a kiss on his cheek and she said, go talk to your dad. And <laughs> so, he comes in and he blows in my face and I said, how much did you have? And he said, a beer. And I said, no, that's, that's not a beer. Um, so tell me the truth. And he did. It's curious to me how she was well aware of one of my own sons, but yet my behavior, she was never able to. And as we have talked about it over the years, it really felt like where we were at was she married what she thought was a man of faith of no issues aware that i had had some issues as a teenager but worked through those he's a return missionary all those credentials that you check honestly it means that you checked some boxes but there's some serious ones that are unchecked so it came to a time where my oldest was about to turn eight and i started feeling guilty that my behavior was really, if I was really honest with myself, that I wasn't worthy to baptize him. I would go to church and it was in a time when cell phones were just coming out. So I wore a pager and I'd set my pager off so I could leave sacrament meeting and go sit in our car and, and listen to music and, and whatnot. And honestly, it was a weird time. So my wife would say to me, you know, your kids are going to see this. They're going to want that behavior. So I started feeling guilty about that. And I started visiting with the bishop. I really, really liked the bishop. So I poured it all out on him. I told him that I'd been smoking weed. I told him that I'd been drinking. I told him that I, I had issues. I needed to get myself better. But still never really knowing how to fix what was really at the core 
of all of this. And so I promised him that I would quit drinking and I made the decision to tell my wife. And when I did, as you can imagine, trust was completely blown right out of my marriage. It, it was difficult years of, can I trust him when he's not with me? Can I trust him when I take the kids and vacation in Utah to see the grandparents? It was difficult years that took a really long time to work through. And so the, the song that um, Guns N' Roses sings about Sweet Child of Mine says that she has eyes of the bluest skies and talks about, I would hate to look into those eyes and, and see an ounce of pain. And I put a ton of pain into my wife's eyes. And as I mentioned earlier, they were difficult times because of what I had told her. And so working through those areas and still really being physically involved in the church and spiritually uninvolved, we made the decision to move to Nebraska. And by that time, I was sober. And, and from that time, I promised my wife that I wouldn't drink again. I kept that promise, but kept reliving it all over in my mind, playing it over and over and over. And I know you know, after listening to your story, how difficult it is to push it all aside and really kind of move forward. And so we lived in Nebraska for a few years and things with my job basically changed and we moved back here and I was super bitter about moving back to Utah. It's still going to church, but still not so involved and still really honestly thinking about how people have influenced my feelings about the church and really not being able to really honestly put that stuff aside where the people said, yeah, yeah, the church is perfect, but the people aren't, but the people are the ones running it and trying to, you know, run that interesting balance between the two was really super difficult for me. As you can see by looking at me, I'm not exactly the most mainstream looking guy. Uh, I felt like from the time of my brother's issue, when I was 14, that it was very difficult for me to feel like other people felt. It was difficult for me to feel and understand something that is really visible now. Anxiety and depression are very real things that are happening now and people are used to talking about them. But this coming from an age where it wasn't really talked about that much. And so it was sort of eye-opening to me. But uh, there was a time when the prophet had said that if you read the Book of Mormon by the end of the year, to expect miracles in your life. And honestly, I never heard that talk and I never read that. But I was in the gym one day with one of my friends and she was talking about that. And, and she said, Kevin, you should read the Book of Mormon. And I think you'll have a miracle by the end of the year. And I looked at her and I said, no, I won't. And I'm not going to do that. But I devised some way of which I did, of which I gave this proposal to my wife. And I really sort of didn't really honestly mean it, sort of cynical about it. But then I decided to read the Book of Mormon. And by that time, our oldest son was up at Utah State going to school and not wanting to go on a mission. So I started reading the Book of Mormon sort of half-heartedly, but really honestly going through that motion. And my wife did too. I didn't finish it by the end of the year, but that year we decided to go to Hawaii. In that year, it was about 2005. He was up at Utah State in 2006 in January. We went to Hawaii and I finished the Book of Mormon on the plane over. And uh, felt really good that that's really honestly the first time that I had really read it from the front to the back. And I can't say that I got a whole ton out of it because it wasn't really my entire idea at the time. But when we were in Hawaii, it was raining like crazy in Kauai. And we were having breakfast one morning and my phone rang. And we'd only been there for a couple days. And it was my son. And he said, Dad? And I said, yeah, man, what's up? And he said, Dad, would you support me on a mission? Oh, my gosh. And honestly, 
there's no way that I could actually look at you with straight eyes and not look at you and say, that wasn't a miracle because it was, it was not on his radar. It was not on my radar for him. We had already had this talk of, this is what I think you would get out of the mission and this and this and this. And selfishly, these are the things that I think you could gain from that. But he said, dad, I don't want to go on a mission. I said, well, will you do me a favor? Hey, just pray about it. See if it's right for you. And then the other thing is, if you wouldn't mind, just get a patriarchal blessing and see what God has to say for you. And then, you know, you do what you need to do. And he said, okay, dad, uh, very obedient, the oldest son, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So through that, what happened was he went up there, made a decision to go on a mission, asked if we would support him. Of course we will. He said he would like to go on a Spanish-speaking mission to San Diego. That would really make him happy. Well, what he did get was Mongolia. Oh, my gosh. And what he did get was Mongolian, the Mongolian language, in a place that has weather that's nowhere near San Diego. Oh, my. <laughs> and, an, and a language that's nowhere near Spanish. He served a faithful mission, but when he came home, he was battling some issues of his own mental health. So I searched and I found a therapist for him by some kind of act of God, honestly, who she told me in the beginning, I have no openings, but I will see you and I'll hear your story. The miracle was she decided to see him the next day. And she wow. started working him through the issues. And long story short, I don't really have all the permission really to talk about that, except for the fact that it was amazing to me to watch the growth that he had through therapy. And this then was the beginning of my relationship with therapy. So we're probably talking somewhere around the year of 2008. And I had made the decision at that time to put my parents in time out. I thought it was a great idea because our relationship was messed up. My feelings about them was messed up and so much unresolved issue in, in regard to me and them. And so I put them in time out. I started becoming jealous of my son's growth and everything that was happening through him in therapy that I asked if she would see me. And for a few years, she and I would meet regularly, and she helped me through the things that I was experiencing, and that was the guilt that I caused my brother's death, the guilt that I caused my parents to really not care for me at all, and everything in regard to unresolved issues of drinking and um, everything in my own life that was really kind of turned upside down. So this therapist, her name is Steph. I will always uh, thank her for everything that she did for me. Because really, after five years of having my uh, time out with my parents, never seeing them, um, I got back into the house because my son was going to get married. The marriage, I thought, was a perfect time for me to to take them to the home. I thought that the marriage was a perfect time for me to break down the barriers of my issues with my parents. And the funny thing about it is lesson learned with putting in, putting them in timeout was never going to work. Boundaries were never going to work. They weren't going to change. And so it was a really, really difficult time. But the therapist staff really helped me through that. As we fast forward, still my issues with the church, I lost a job. And then soon after that, I lost another job. I became about as low as I've ever been in my life. I got into the world of antidepressants um, and had felt like my marriage was really not where I wanted to be. And we were not doing well as a couple. We weren't communicating well. We were not well. I was let go of a job that was seriously devastating to me. And I reached a point where I had experienced this at times throughout my life, but deeper than I ever had experienced suicidal ide ideations, I was in a bad place. And so through therapy, the therapist would say to me, so what keeps you from committing suicide? 
interesting question, sure. I'll tell you what it is. I've sat across the table from people who have had suicide in their families, and I have watched what has happened to them and what kind of of situations it causes for their families. And here I am, and I can't do that to my wife, which told me that I've been down in a black hole, that there's a far deeper place that I've never been before. And I was able to at least have that thought process that many don't when they're deeper than I ever was. And so working through that and beginning the employment that I have now and a lot of miracles that kind of happened through that, it was fascinating to me where God really kind of plays out in my life because my wife and I got into marriage counseling, which really helped me. And it really, honestly, Ashley, it was not long after that well, first of all, we had moved to West Farmington um, from Kaysville. The ward that we were attending was a way different situation. And the bishop came to me and he said, you know, I've been praying for somebody like you. And I looked at him and I said, no one prays for me. And he, he said, you're the answer to my prayer. And I said, I'm not the answer to anyone's prayer. And he said, you're the answer to mine. Will you and your wife teach the marriage and family class? Wow. Which got us being able to teach adults, which got us in the process of really meeting people within the ward, really seeing that, you know what, we're not so different than so many other people. And long story short, it wasn't really long after that that I was called to be in a bishopric in a young single adult ward. Um, oh, my gosh. In the Alpha area. And the odd thing about that was, though it was an amazing experience and where I had been spiritually It was a way good experience for me, but a super dysfunctional bishopric where we barely talked to each other. And it really made me realize that God really runs his church regardless. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. It was very eye-opening to me. And I learned a lot of things. And my wife and I were able to develop amazing relationships with the young single adults of which is an area that we spent about six and a half years in. Uh, Normally, you're not in those uh, wards not that long. But after we were released from the bishopric, I was called to be in the high council. And that that in itself was really kind of an interesting experience because I said to my wife one day, you know, um, part of the expectation is you're speaking in these wards with me every month. And she said, no, I'm not. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, actually, you are. It's, it's part of the deal. And she said, no, you're joking. So we went to the bishop's house. And a young single adult, a stake, you're assigned to a ward. And it's, a, it's like you're a third counselor in those wards. And so I was always in their bishoprics and their meetings and really a part of that ward, even though it was a stake calling. And the funny thing about it was they like to have ward prayers on Sunday, get the young single adults together in those wards and have a prayer and meet in members' homes and such. And and it was a cool experience. But my point at all that was the bishop's wife said to my wife, so how are you going to like talking with Kevin every month? And she said, so this is where it's kind of bad because I'm a joker. I like to to play jokes and and I like to have fun. And, And she said, so he's not joking? And, and she said, oh, no, he, he, he's not. But it was really awesome to see that growth of my wife through that whole process of where we started and where we are now and the journey that we are at. So my feeling is the church versus the people and how we've been able to really kind of process that, because I don't think we're ever going to be able to get rid of our issues of how we are as people, because we're just humans. All of us have our own deal. Everybody goes to church. Everybody has their own baggage. And I love the talk where it says, just because our sins smell differently. Um, <laughs> we we sin differently, but we all sin. And being able to really process through that, that I became really super good in my own skin. Yes, I'm different than other people. Yes, I have had experiences, but so have other people. Yes, these experiences have molded who I am as a person. Yes, I've had marriage counseling. And yes, we've gone through the bad times, the good times, and just over at Lagoon, watching the roller coaster, we've been on our own little roller coaster. But lessons that we've learned through all of that is our relationship is honestly better. 
and being able to be in the young single environment and being with them and their church meetings gave me a stronger testimony of where the church is at with the young people. Because you hear, and this is one of the things that I can say that I love about your program, you hear these fascinating stories that there, there's been a couple that have honestly reduced me to tears. And I even would dare say the name, but one of them in particular is one that I will study over and over and over, and his name's Dustin. And the story is straight up amazing to me. And more than that, fascinating, a dude that I would seriously love to meet. In the end, watching all these experiences that we've gone through and where we are at with our own children, where we are at with our own faith, it was always planted inside my head by my mother. Trust is greater than love. And I would repeat this to my therapist who would look at me and say, so what does that say? Trust is greater than love, Kevin. I love you, but I don't trust you. These are the kind of things that have played over and over in my head. She would say to me, it's an unwise bird that craps in its own nest, Kevin. All these sayings that people call Kevinisms in, in my life are things that I've repeated over and over and over of which I've been able to process through and decide I have to put all of the baggage aside. I have to put all of my feelings about people aside and focus on really what is true, where I've taken my testimony, where it is, and where it is, I've stripped it all down. I know what any Mormon literature looks like. I know what's said. I know what has said about the church. And so I've stripped my feelings down to God, Jesus. And if I left this faith really for good, if I left it, I don't know what I could follow because I don't believe they are the same person. I can't believe they are the same person. And so when it's said that God has a body of flesh and bones tangible as man's, but glorified and perfected, and so does Jesus Christ. And understanding that and reading the scriptures where, and the word was made flesh and he dwelt amongst us, but that I feel like is so cool when you read um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And I can't read the Scriptures and think to myself, God and Jesus are the same person. And furthermore, why would Jesus pray to Himself? And now, my Father, glorify me with Thine own self, with the glory I had with Thee, before the world was. And so as I put all these pieces together, I've stripped my testimony to God, Jesus, the Restoration, Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, a prophet, and Revelation. And everything else is just white noise to me on the outside, bunny trails that I frankly don't care about. I do believe in all of those things that that I have said, I do believe in all of it. And the rest of it, I've just learned to push it all aside because I'm a better person in the church than out of the church. I have had experiences that have molded me into the person that I am now. And through my experiences of where I walk this fine line of where me and you are at today, that fine line becomes, I've had issues in my past a wife that said to me, your false advertisement and how I took that. And then where I'm at today, and should I really talk about it? And the crazy thing about it, Ashley, is because of where I work, I've had experiences where I work with young single adult aged kids. I'm a guy in my 60s, my mid 60s. And I work with all these 20 something year olds that come into my office that want to talk about their issues. They want to talk about their addictions and where they're at. And then the same thing happened in the young single adult environment. Here I am in the young single adult environment. My kids are this age. I church with kids this age. And I work with kids this age. What's God trying to teach me? And that thin line that I walk right there of, do I, do I really want to talk about my past? And the answer is, yeah, I do. Because I have things to teach. And so where I've come full circle with all that, it's not what I need to learn. It's what I can help them learn. What I would end with my story with all of this is 
there's a line in my patriarchal blessings that I've been sort of a cynic at, kind of pushing my nose up on poo-poo. And there's a line in it that says, you will have the opportunity to bear your testimony to many people throughout the world. <laughs> and I, I've sort of scoffed at that until I met your co-host. And she said, would you be willing to come on this show? And I said to her, Lauren, it would be super difficult for me because I don't really think my story is something that people would really be interested in. And then experiences happened at that fireside. There is a lady that's involved in the addiction recovery program as a missionary, and her son was there to listen to me talk. And years before that, her son was somebody I pulled out of a heroin house in, in Clearfield. And oh he God. has, he was there and he gave me a hug at the end and, and he told me he loved me. And through experiences like this, this is an opportunity to bear my testimony to many people throughout the world. This <laughs> is that opportunity. What you have created here is the ability to be able to tell amazing stories. And those amazing stories of comeback are something that you hear less about. And what you hear about is, oh, did you hear X left the church? Y left the church? Z left the church? And we're flooding our information and our social media platforms with other stories of people leaving. And what I love about your deal is you are putting out onto social media stories of people coming back, true stories of faith, p true stories of people who honestly and truly have been at or near the bottom, including yourself, and people who have been involved, like your father, who have a lot to do with your ability to be able to come back, feel good about yourself, and be able to move on with your life as somebody that's productive and being able to do something that would be a benefit to members of this church or people who are not in this church or who people are that are struggling, have struggled, left, and really do come back. And so really where I would end my story is that 100%, I have not lived the principles of this church. And I do my best at where I stand now to lift where I stand and and really my story really becomes a story of struggle. And even if the principles of this church weren't true, I'm better off by observing the law of tithing. I'm better off by bettering my health. I'm better off by attending church. I'm better off by being able to do the things that would benefit other people. Be kind, be human, be respectful, take care of um shine down a rock concert that i went to a couple days ago to sing a song about human we're only human in our humanity we have to be kind to people who aren't our skin color who aren't our religion who aren't our faith who aren't many of the things that we profess to be and let's be kind to each other and so my testimony really is god lives jesus is the christ and this honestly is his kingdom on earth, and it's our job to be able to proclaim it, teach it, live it, believe it, and do whatever we can to help others. Mic drop, Kevin. That was amazing. I I am just so impressed with your story and your testimony. And I just think it's funny that your first, you know, comment was like, I don't know if my if my story is for this podcast. And it's like your story is meant to be on this podcast. Like it is 100 percent meant to be on this podcast. And I am so grateful that you came on and that you ran into Lauren and it was so meant to be. And I mean, you're just so full of light and love and what an honor it is to have you on the podcast and to be able to give you a platform to share your story with the world. Thanks, Ashley. You are just so awesome. And I mean, I think that's the perfect way to, to wrap this up. I mean, you're just, I, I'm amazed. I feel like it's an honor to have you on. And just hearing that line in your patriarchal blessing, dang, 
What an honor to have you on the podcast. Well, Kevin, is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? So, you know, Lauren, when I met her that night, she introduced me to her father. I have asked her since about that, but in some of the texts that Lauren and I have shared, I told her that I didn't believe in random. I never knew that I was going to be involved in, in something. That room was full of people, and I had no idea what that was going to be. And when she came up and introduced me to her father and and mentioned me some of his struggle and, and since hearing her story on your podcast, I mean, it was, uh, again, another story of, of sincere faith, uh, and I loved it. And I wish only the best for her dad and, and his recovery and, and what he's doing. And just listening to your story, one thing that that was really kind of eye-opening and, and something that I honestly try to really live with my own children is my father worked two jobs and he was not there. My dad was not present and couldn't be. And a lot of people didn't know what he did, but he worked at a bank during the day and he worked at the railroad at night. And he was one of those old fashioned dudes that was born in the twenties that by golly, my wife is not going to work. She's going to be a stay at home mom. And it was super frustrating. And he was, he, he was a black and white dude. And we had very, very little relationship. And it's been through therapy and my own work that I really wanted to say, I want to stop what's happened in his generation and in my generation and my own relationship with my boys and now their wives and now the few grandchildren that we have two and, and uh, third one coming in December and what my relationship will be with them and how to move forward with them and showing them that I'm the dad they need. And it's really kind of curious through all this time, what my boys come to me for versus what my boys go to my wife for and how we're able to communicate and move through. And I think what I would share is that we really can, if we want to, God's blessed us with this ability to be able to have a strong mind. And it's amazing what you can do with your mind if you really want to. I made up the decision in my life that I would stop the way that I treated my sons and completely turn full circle. It's been through that that's helped me to be able to develop that relationship with them. And that's really what this life is about, trying to learn how to move through those issues that we do have, move through. All of us are going to experience troubles because we're not going to get out of this, this life without trouble. But what we can do is learn from those lessons. We can be better. We can have happiness, even though through our lives, there are those downtimes and it's how to figure out how to work through those downtimes so that when you get them, you know the process of being able to work through them, which is something that I think you have. And I, what I was getting at is I totally respect that relationship of not giving up that your father had. And that's the guy that I want to be for my kids. That's the guy that I want to be the example of because life is hard. Well, I'd say that you're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> you're kind. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you for being on the podcast. You're you so bet. awesome. I, I appreciate it. So thank you. you bet. Thank you so much for being a supporter of the Comeback Podcast and listening to our episodes. It would mean so much to us if you would like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps other people be able to find us and we want to share this message to everyone.